On this episode of Doing the Most, we are turning 50 pounds of cherries into a mead. Homemade brews and berry sauteurs, everything from meat to roast. Big creation, fermentation, and ebriation, doing the most. Those of you who have been fans of the channel for a long time might remember our video, The Curious Case of the Tart Cherry Mead from a couple years ago. That mead was made with 15 pounds of cherries and a bunch of honey and a bunch of water. And the goal with that mead was to create something that didn't require chemical stabilizers, wasn't super boozy, and used mostly natural ingredients for balancing. That was because one of the people who was going to be consuming the mead had that preference. And so when Anna's cousin approached me this year and said they expected a big harvest from their cherry tree this time around, I challenged her to get us 50 pounds of cherries off of that tart cherry tree that we could make a no water cherry mead with. And so I set up the same challenge for myself. No chemical stabilizers, not super boozy, and natural ingredients included. And last time around, we did some cold maceration with the cherries. That's where you add pectic enzyme and keep it pretty cold, like refrigerator temperatures, and the pectic enzyme will break down the cell walls of your fruit. Doing this over the course of about a week really breaks down the fruit well and prepares it for juicing. So, for this year's tart cherry mead, we decided to do a similar thing. We cold macerated all 50 pounds of the cherries for about a week with some pectic enzyme, and that way they broke down really well for us before we put them into our fruit press. Now, next level on this would be actually to just ferment fruit and honey with some yeast and some enzyme to break it down, but not to actually juice it, to leave the skins and the fruit matter and all that in there. And that really contributes to a big, bold mead. Now, I didn't want to go that route because I didn't want to deal with all the fruit matter. I didn't want to deal with having the pits in there. And so I think that this was the best outcome for this particular mead, but your mileage may vary. So what you're going to see in this video is that cold maceration process, us juicing the cherries and then bringing it up to full volume by adding in a gallon of honey. So let's take a look at our ingredients. Our recipe for this tart cherry mead ended up being 50 pounds of cherries, pressed to create about four gallons worth of juice, one gallon of honey, RC212 yeast, and Opti Red. In secondary, we added two pounds of malted extrin, three tablespoons of vanilla extract, and two and a half pounds of erythritol. This mead begins with 50 pounds of tart cherries. These tart cherries were picked right off the tree by Anna's cousin. Ended up freezing the cherries so we could break down the cell walls that will help with juice extraction, but also with color and tannin extraction. To aid in that extraction process, I used a very, very healthy dose of pectic enzyme. Pectic enzyme will break down the pectins in these cherries, helping them release their juices and helping them kind of fall apart in preparation for the juicing process. So this is about half the cherries here. I went ahead and let that thaw out. And once that had thawed out and kind of fallen to the bottom of the bucket, I added all the rest of the frozen cherries. And of course, a few more tablespoons of pectic enzyme. Stir, stir, stir as best as we can here. And that pectic enzyme will get to work on those cherries and eventually they will release a ton of their juice even before we get to juicing them. So after about a week of this process of soaking them cold, it's time to get them juiced. And so I racked off as much of the cherry juice as I could that way I could avoid making too much of a mess as we get the cherries into the fruit press. You can see there, there's about two and a half gallons of juice already. So we started scooping all of our cherries into this fruit press bag, and this is a five gallon fruit press, so I can process quite a bit of fruit in this press at a time. We began cranking that down to extract the juice. Mm -hmm. 
This fruit press has a bunch of spacers that come with it that let you press it pretty low down in the bottom of the press. However, I had to cut a bunch of extra spacers for my press because it just didn't come with enough to really get all the juice out of the fruit. So as you can see here, we raised the press up, added some more spacers, and then continued cranking it down. This smelled so good as we were pressing this juice out. Just that fresh, rich cherry juice really perfumed the whole studio. Once we had extracted all of our cherry juice, it was time to get our gallon of honey in there. And as you can see, this honey was incredibly crystallized, but I had weighed it out, so I knew exactly how much honey was in this bucket, so we just scraped it out until the bucket was empty. And then we brought out my wine whip attached to a power drill and blended the honey into our cherry juice. Time to get a gravity reading on that. This ended up clocking in right at 1.120. And then I added Opti Red. This is just a natural color preserver. And then we pitched two five gram packets of our yeast. And this was just because we wanted to make sure we started with a big cell count right there at the beginning. Stir, stir, stir. And the lid goes on. Airlock attached and we let it ride. The next day, you can see fermentation activity has started. And a day later, we've got a nice fruit cap starting to form. This took about three, almost four weeks to ferment out until it had stopped. And it stopped just a shade above dry on our hydrometer at 1.007. However, there was no sweetness to this at that gravity. So maybe it stalled at 1.007, or maybe there was just enough stuff in there for the viscosity to be that high, but this was tart. So I went ahead and racked that off for bulk aging. Based on the last time I balanced a tart cherry mead, I knew I was gonna need some vanilla extract and some erythritol. So I just followed exactly how I did it the last time, knowing that I was probably gonna to have to add more to balance this out later. A very gentle stir, stir, stir here, just to try and get this incorporated without too much breaking of the surface tension at the top of that mead. We don't want to oxidize anything. And then our airlock goes on to let this age for a while. About six, seven months later, I took a taste of it and I knew it was going to need a little bit of added balancing. So over the course of the next few days, I added more erythritol and more vanilla extract, and I, I felt like it needed a little bit more body. So I ended up adding some maltodextrin too. So the more typical ways of getting a big jammy mouth coating mead like this would be to either A, ferment up to the yeast's alcohol tolerance and then balance the sugars by back sweetening with more honey, or B, you would ferment to the ABV that you wanna to get to. So you would calculate the amount of honey for that ABV, ferment up to that level, maybe you only wanna to go to 10%, and then to chemically stabilize and then balance back with back sweetening honey. What we're doing here is quite a bit unconventional using maltodextrin and erythritol, but they are both naturally derived white powders and they do the things that I want them to do by mimicking that viscosity and giving some non-fermentable sweetness to this mead. And eventually I got this up to a flavor and mouthfeel profile that I liked. And now this is still relatively young at just over a half a year since yeast pitch. And I think this one is really good already. However, I do think this is a mead that is gonna benefit from probably another year or so of aging. So I'm releasing this video now, 
but these bottles are gonna go back into a dark closet for a while to come out at another time. Since Anna's cousin did so much to help us with this meat, including picking the cherries, destemming them, and helping us press out all the juice, I decided it would be fun to bring her back because I found a bottle of our original batch. I had one bottle left of that batch from, I think it was 2020, still in my closet. And so I brought her back for a taste test where we side by side compared the two different meads. Anna's cousin is here, who, Hello. as you saw at the beginning of the video, uh, helped with all of the cherry. Basically, you're this you're responsible for this whole thing. You pick them, you juice them. 50 pounds. All I did was hang out with it for a few months. <laughs> you had texted last night asking if I had a bottle left, mm -hmm. and I did. From the last time we did this, which was not all cherry, there was some water in here. This one, was, this one was no water, yeah. this, this batch. The oh, color. wow. <laughs> <laughs> Considerably different as well. Honestly, if you're looking through, this one does look more red, but it's pink. Mm hmm. Very different colors. So, which one do we try first, the new one or the old one? I think we should try the old one first. I think that way we kind of form a baseline of what your cherries tasted like the first time we did this. Okay. Now, it is, we were talking about this earlier, it is younger. This yes. is. You, you picked these cherries this past summer, mm -hmm. July, August probably, and it's February now. So, yeah. and this is like a year and a half, two years old. So. Something like that. Big, big jump. Let's, let's start with the lighter one. two years actually. It tastes like cherry juice. Yeah, it's not very sweet. No. It is very thin, which is mm -hmm. kind of nice. It, no burn. At all. Right. For it's alcohol, very smooth. Yeah. For as you know, whiny as it smells, mm -hmm. very smooth. There's a little cherry note there. There's a little juicy, fruity note in there, but it's it's not big and bold. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to do the swishing thing. <laughs> yeah, it didn't didn't work out. It'd be good as a spritzer. Oh yeah, like half and half with some sparkling water. Yeah, but I just like spritzers. <laughs> do a juice too. There's not anything to dislike about it. Almost it almost has a little bit of a cranberry flavor, I feel it like. It does, it does. Like a cranberry juice, like yeah. an ocean spray, kind yeah. of. Which is probably not the- not sweet, but. Yeah, and there's there's not much sweetness, so that acid, mm -hmm. I think, is is punching through a little bit more. All right, you wanna go to the, the, right. the new newfangled version? Sure. Okay. Ooh, that smells very different. Yeah, it does. It smells sweet. This smell is like up here, and this one's a lower mm -hmm. smell. The base notes. Yeah. 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 I feel like this scent is also <laughs> thicker. It's got more of like a thick, rich, sweet nose to it. Like yeah. It's so red that it's purple. It's very, it's again, stark contrast. All right, let's get in there. Okay. I know this came from pie cherries, mm -hmm. but it tastes like it came from like, like black cherry, like the darker mm -hmm. cherry variety. Mm -hmm. Whereas like this one, yeah, tastes like sour cherries. I think the amount of like tannin and those compounds we got out of those cherry skins really boosted that profile. It has a And then obviously it's got twice as much acid in here. Yeah. The flavor is more like concave, like not round, but it's like, like folds around you. Mm -hmm. Whereas this one is nice and like flat and light and springy. Mm -hmm. This one is definitely heavier. It's big and rich, but it's not like, it's not cloyingly sweet. No. Like it doesn't make you go, I don't, you know, I don't know if I can finish the glass. Very different meads, very different processes, very different profiles. You can smell the honey in this. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's, because it tastes like cherries, but it smells like honey. Mm -hmm. Maybe that is why it's weird to me. <laughs> well, thank you for coming and tasting sure. this. I'm going to do a complete tasting right after this. It's very leggy. Like, it really sticks to the sides of the glass. I'll have to see if I can get B-roll of this. There is no debating 
the cherry aromatics on this mead. It just smells like straight up tart cherry juice, black cherry juice. Some may want the sweetness to come up a little bit more to balance that tartness, but I didn't want to take too much of the edge off and I feel like, at least for my palate, I achieved what I wanted with the sweetness. The jamminess is really there. Coats your teeth, coats the inside of your mouth, like your whole palate is kind of slicked in thick, syrupy, cherry goodness. The depth of the flavor is so intense. It's dark and earthy and tannic and there's just a little bit of grit there. Like it's the, the tannin value in this really clings around, but not in a bitter way or a, or a highly astringent way. The tannin kind of spackles the inside of your mouth and so you feel it in a lot of different areas where sometimes a, a, a big tannic mead will kind of hit you down here or hit you right down the middle of your tongue. This kind of dances around your palate. This really highlights the depth of this fruit by really focusing on just the fruit and just the honey. And there's not anything else, even that vanilla just takes some of the edge off. There's not anything else in there that distracts from those flavor profiles. I cannot wait to see how this develops over the next year, two years, maybe three years. Super good, really interesting challenge and quite a bit of fun to execute. You can join our Discord server or follow us on Instagram. Follow us on Twitch. We'll be back on Twitch at some point, someday, when my life slows down. And thank you for subscribing. If you haven't yet subscribed, it's really easy. Just click that subscribe button down there and ring that notification bell. You'll never miss a new video from doing the most. Until next time, happy brewing, stay safe, and cheers.